So we've we've begun. We've gotten started. Yeah, Verletta started the recording. Great. Well, hello, everybody. Um, Welcome to Hacking the Academy. Um, first, I would like to say that the University of Washington Libraries acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip and Muckleshoot nations. And second, for this event, we are following and upholding the library's code of conduct policy, which you can find here and check out. Um, I'll put this in the chat box for everybody. That's our code of conduct. Um, Hacking the Academy is, event, is an event series inspired by the book Hacking the Academy by Daniel Cohen and Tom Scheinfeld, a book which investigates whether institutions and scholarship, as they've been known for decades or even centuries, are out of date or obsolete. We've been running this event since 2017, and over the years, we've heard from many faculty and graduate student researchers here at the UW who have taken exciting, novel, and radical approaches to scholarship much of which has been capital O open, as in open source and open access, as well as focused on and shared with the public. Our speaker today is Dr. Kate Starbird, an associate professor in the Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering. She is also a co-founder of the Center for an um, she is also a co-founder of the Center for an Informed Public and is here to speak with us about the center's rapid response program, which is designed to, in real time, monitor and monitor the spread of online misinformation and provide the public and media with tools to fight it. Thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Starbird. And we're so excited for your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I'm gonna try to uh, share my screen here. Let's see if I can get all of that going pretty quickly and then um, jump in to this, this talk. And I, um, I'm gonna do a couple things in this talk. I wanna talk um, both about um, our rapid response model and, and kind of um, what we're what we've done in the past and, and possibly what we're hoping to do, but also kind of show you some of the research that came out of that in the context of election 2020. So I'm going to give you a little bit of like describing our process and a little bit of like here are some of our our findings, and I'm happy to talk about um, both as as the conversation um, goes on. Just one second, I'm going to try to move things around so I can see my notes properly. All right, um, before I get too far, I, I do wanna just note that uh, the work that, I, that I'm gonna talk about today is so collaborative. There's so many people that were involved in it, um, students and postdoctoral fellows at the Center for an Informed Public. Um, we have collaborators at Stanford and cl my collaborators at UW as well, Emma Spiro, Jevin West, and Ryan Kahlo, Chris Coward as well, and uh, Mike Caulfield, who was at Washington State, but we've now hired, so I need to update my slide there. Um, and then colleagues at Stanford and other, and other folks and um, want to acknowledge our, our funders as well. Um, today, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, mis- and disinformation and particularly disinformation. I'll tell you a little bit about the difference um, in the context of election 2020. And um, there's a lot of different places that I could start this talk, but I want to start um, in, in a space that I think is um, is really Im, Im, important, and, I, and I'm gonna and, and I'm gonna start here. It's a little shocking, um, but I and I want to um, I want to go back here. This is January 6, and this is the view outside of the Capitol building, the U.S. Capitol building. Um, we've got this sort of collection of flags, um, Trump flags, and U.S. flags, and Confederate flags. Um, and they're being waved by a group of activists who've overtaken the US Capitol grounds at that time. And they're wearing a lot of red, white, and blue of like American patriotism, as well as Trump support. And also we've got some folks wearing camouflage and protective gear of military and militia. And I wanna kind of get a sense of like, what happened that day and what does our research speak to like how that happened and, and maybe um, what we might wanna do in the future to prevent something like that. So for a little bit of what, um, what might have motivated that insurrection attempt? And I'm gonna use that term here because I do think um, though, though we'll talk about people that got swept up into it that may not have known what they were part of, that there was um, some, there were folks there that were attempting a, a coup or an insurrection. Um, but for some insight into what motivated that attempt, we could look into the Twitter account 
of the US president that day, where he repeated the false claim that his sacred landslide victory had been stolen from him and his followers, and where he seems to refer to the insurrectionists as patriots. And this tweet was a lot, what was the latest in a long series of tweets where going back to the summer of 2020, where President Trump had attempted to sort of sow doubt in the election results. And this, th this activity, both his comments and a lot of other comments, and I'll show you some of them, um, are be become to come to be known collectively as the big lie. And this kind of effort to, to sow doubt in the election and to falsely claim that it was, um, that there was massive or systematic voter fraud. And I'm gonna talk about this as a disinformation campaign. So back in October, 2020, Yokai Bankler and colleagues described a seemingly coordinated effort to discredit the mail-in voting process as an elite driven disinformation campaign. And we accept that disinformation framing here and extend it to the broader efforts to sow doubt in the election procedures and eventually to discredit the election results. The disinformation campaign was and still is an attack on democracy itself. It was meant to undermine trust in the democratic process um, and is actually having reverberating effects on our, our population still today where um, a large portion of Americans, including some like 70% of Republicans do not believe that the uh, election was legitimate. Before I get too far, I want to do some definitional work to make sure we're all on the same page about misinformation and disinformation, and particularly the difference between misinformation and disinformation. So misinformation is information that's false, but not necessarily intentionally false. Um, can be um, you know, information that gets out of date, that was, that was true at one point, but it's not true later. Um, or information where someone's trying to understand what's happening, like in crisis events that I study often, things are happening quickly and people try to understand it and they sometimes get things wrong, but they don't mean to get things wrong. Disinformation, on the other hand, is false or misleading information that's purposefully seeded and or spread for a specific objective. For instance, a financial or political objective or in the online world, a reputational objective. And disinformation actually has some other features that are really interesting as well. Now, it's effective disinformation isn't necessarily false, but rather misleading. It's often built around a true or plausible core, but then layered with falsehoods or exaggerations to, to sort of uh, distort how others perceive reality. And it functions not as, you know, not as a single piece of content, but as a campaign. So we often think of, of like, oh, is that piece of content or that meme, is that misinformation, disinformation or whatever. But, but disinformation, you really can't understand as a single piece of content. You have to think about it as many different information act actions that kind of function together to distort our reality. And through, through this view, disinformation can really be resistant to fact checking on a single piece of information. And it can't always be simply reduced, okay, that's false information, because a lot of times it's like true-ish pieces that are just distorted in ways that are meant to deceive. And this is a really tricky piece of it. And this is one we're gonna keep coming back to in this talk and in, in kind of the ways that, that we understand things um, through our research is that disinformation campaigns intentionally mislead, but many of the participants in a disinformation campaign are unwitting agents. They're unaware that the information they're spreading is false and they're unaware of their role in the larger campaign. Um, there's a lot of different names for them that go back through the history. Disinformation can be tied to Soviet intelligence back in the um, 50s, 60s and 70s and 80s. And they, they intentionally tried to get people to spread it without their knowledge. And so unwitting agents have always been a part of disinformation campaigns. Um, okay, so let's go back to where we started, but we're gonna go a little bit back and further in time. So I'm gonna talk about disinformation in elections and, and our work here, but let's go back to, to, um, to 2016 first, because I wanna draw a contrast here. And, and for those of you that were thinking about sort of geopolitics in 2016, there's kind of a different story. So if you look at the story of online disinformation in 2016, we think of it predominantly as one of foreign in origin, perpetrated by inauthentic actors or fake accounts and coordinated by various agencies in Russia. For instance, there was this in, in internet research agency in St. Petersburg in Russia where they hired a bunch of people to operate troll accounts that pretended to be Americans and, and spread misleading content that sowed doubt and division and tried to advance Russia's interests uh, in, by manipulating uh, US voters in that election. So that was the story of 2016. It wasn't the whole story, um, but it was one we told ourselves. It was an easy one that allowed us to focus on outside actors and top-down campaigns. When we look at 2020, we see a very different story 
um, when we're thinking about online uh, disinformation in the election. It was largely domestic. It was largely coming from inside the United States. Um, there may have been some foreign activities there, but they weren't, they weren't leading it. They may have been echoing what, what US actors were saying on their own. And it was, it was often perpetrated not by fake personas, but by authentic blue check and even verified accounts, along with other anonymous members of the online crowd. And it wasn't entirely coordinated, but it was largely cultivated and even organic in places with everyday people creating and spreading disinformation about the election. And today I'm gonna to talk, uh, for the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about that campaign and I'm gonna tie it to some of the work we were doing to study that campaign. Um, I'm gonna show you some examples uh, and then explain to you how we're thinking about this activity collectively as participatory disinformation and think a little bit about what that means. Um, but before I get into the data and analysis, let me talk about um, the Hacking the Academy piece and how we came to study um, the, the 2020 election. We've been doing some research in, um, in other kinds of disinformation. We hadn't worked in the US political space prior. Um, we looked at foreign operations, but not anything that was domestic really. Um, and what, ha what happened in 2020, in about August 2020, a group from Stanford reached out to us and they said, do you want to partner with us on this thing we're going to call the, well, we didn't even have a name for it yet, Be eventually became known as the Election Integrity Partnership. Uh, and this was, um, and we said yes, we didn't know what it was yet, we said yes, and we, we kind of worked out the details as we went. Um, but what this was, was a multi-stakeholder collaboration uh, using a rapid response model. And what we did was we collaborated with three other organizations, Stanford, Graphica, and the DFR Lab. And we also worked with a range of partners in government, civil society, and at the tech platforms, the social media platforms. And we worked, um, they were external partners. And internally, our four teams worked to identify, analyze, and respond to election-related mis- and disinformation in real time. In other words, we didn't want to just be collecting data and writing papers that would come out in a year and a half. We wanted to be able to make a difference in the moment to help people see what was happening and maybe be able to, to take action to counter disinformation as it emerged. So here's kind of a map of how our, our team worked. Um, we, had, uh, we had these different tiers of researchers. Um, we had some researchers um, doing each of these black boxes is where we had different research teams. Um, there was a lot of research teams doing monitoring detection. There were over 100 students. I think most of them were at Stanford um, working as part of the monitoring and detection teams. And then we had um, intake teams that were marking things up and, 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 and triaging and prioritizing, prioritizing things. And then in this box that's kind of in the middle of the bottom, the EIP investigations and analysis, this is where our UW team was. We had about 20, 25 researchers. Um, and we would, we would pick up, you know, tips had come in about where a new piece of disinformation or misinformation was spreading. And we would try to analyze it, see who was spreading it, how fast is it spreading, what platforms is it on. And then we would write up blogs or, um, set, or, or share our information with journalists and try to get it out into the public so people could take action and understand sort of the, the larger patterns and disinformation that were emerging. Um, altogether, I think there were 120 researchers across the four teams. Um, we worked from mid-August through November of 2020. We actually had, we quit at Thanksgiving. We should have kept going. We quit at Thanksgiving because the Stanford team had the, uh, they all went home for Thanksgiving and, and their quarter was over. Um, and we were like, oh, we're, we, things will be done by Thanksgiving. Of course, we should have been working through January 6th and on into the next year. But, um, and then we, uh, we ended up analyzing more than a thousand different tickets that came in through our different processes of, um, of misinformation or misleading information about the election. And we were actually looking at, we started out looking at a few different kinds of inf misinformation about the election. We were looking at um, false or misleading information about election procedures that may have caused people to think that they could vote in the wrong way at the wrong time. We were looking at information that could have led to voter suppression, um, things about voter intimidation, things about long lines uh, and how that might've led people to, to choose not to vote. We were looking at any information that, in, that it encouraged voter fraud. And then we were looking at this whole other kind of information that was false or misleading information that functioned to sow doubt in the election results. And over time, just because 2020 was what it was, this became the main focus of our work. Um, and again, we had over a thousand different tickets and probably um, six or 800, six to 700 of them, excuse me, were in this final category. Um, there's a final report I can point it out to you. It's like 300, 400 pages. If you want to read it, I, 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 uh, I recommend it, but um, it, it, is, it is long, but I'm happy to share that with you. 
as we approach this, when it comes to analysis, our, so our team, I say, was like this, we were tier two, we were like doing more in-depth analysis of, of specific incidents um, or, or narratives that we're spreading. Uh, and our team uses a mixed method approach. We blend qualitative, quantitative, and visual analysis to understand the structure and dynamics of, in this case, election-related mis- and disinformation. And we looked at how um, false and misleading content was produced and spread by whom, and I'm going to show you some of that work here. And I'm going to talk to you um, about it as a participatory disinformation campaign. And so the first thing I want to point out is that our work underscores that the big lie was more than a single false claim or a narrative. It weaved together many different narratives from false claims about dead people voting to false claims about voting machines changing um, votes um, to claims that ballots were printed, printed in foreign countries. And the effort wasn't to actually even put together a coherent story. It was just to like throw spaghetti against the wall, see if something sticks and, and, and not even to maybe articulate an explanation as much as just to create doubt. Um, and it was based uh, on this combination of exaggerations and fabrications. And the idea was that they were trying to give people the false impression that there was massive and systematic voter fraud. In one sense, this, dis this disinformation campaign was a top-down effort. It was spread through the massive megaphones of political elites to their audiences. A primary conveyor of that messages was uh, the former president himself. In his, this tweet, which was posted in June of 2020, President Trump claimed that the election would be rigged, that ballots would be printed and ostensibly filled out in foreign countries, and that it would be the scandal of our times. Now, this is long before anything's happening, right? So it's already setting the stage for people to see uh, to see the election through this lens. And this tweet received hundreds of thousands of engagements in the forms of likes and retweets. There's Facebook posts that were similar that went out. And these are pretty typical numbers um, for President Trump's account at that time, where he had a lot of followers who were very engaged um, with his content who, who would systematically retweet or repost it. If we look more broadly across the course of a, the election 2020 conversation, we actually find that there's a finite number of what we call repeat spreader or repeat offender accounts who are repeatedly influential in the terms of being like highly reshared or retweeted in the spread of content related to the big lie. Um, and so we, we took a list of like, what are the accounts that like received a thousand or more retweets in many different incidents? So they weren't just claiming one kind of issue. They were talking about mail and voter fraud and dead voters and ballots being printed in foreign countries. So they were spreading many different of these false or misleading claims. And so um, if we look, I'm gonna back up here um, and, and give you a sense. So we, we, we have this list of accounts and I'm gonna tell you kind of what kinds of accounts they are here. So one of the things we do is we create network graphs where we take you know, people that, that both retweet the same thing and, and we, can, we can put them together on a network graph to get a sense of the structure of what's happening in these online spaces. Um, and this is a network graph we created, not from voter fraud claims, but just from anybody talking about the election. And, um, and it's about the accounts clustered closer together if they're retweeted by the same accounts. And so it, it gives you this macro level of like the kinds of Twitter accounts that are participating in this content. And we can see very closely a very polarized conversation where we have sort of pro-Biden or anti-Trump accounts in blue. Um, and that we, we've, we've colored in blue here, but they kind of cluster together. And then there's this other group of accounts that are pro-Trump on the red side and the orange side is also pro-Trump, but they're weird structurally. And so when we do a network graph, they come in two pieces. I can talk more about that if anyone's interested later. But what's interesting is when we look at the repeat offenders of mis and disinformation of the accounts that repeatedly spread false claims, all, um, Oh, let me go back. Um, the, there are some, some false claims uh, about the election that come from the content in blue, that come from the, pro, the, the Democrats or pro-Biden side. And a lot of them were related to um, false claims about the, the US Postal Service uh, intentionally hurting the election. And we can trace them back to like false photographs and other kinds of things. So I wanna point out that, that the mis and disinformation wasn't just limited to one side of the political spectrum. But if we look at the accounts that repeatedly spread many different claims and were highly influential, almost all of the top accounts there 
were from the red side of the graph. These are accounts that are um, that were pro-Trump accounts that were repeatedly spreading content that was meant to undermine trust in the election results. And I've highlighted a couple of the different kinds of accounts. I think that's less important now. I think we all get the picture of, of who some of these folks were, but these and other influencers repeatedly amplify false and misleading claims of voter fraud. They set and repeatedly reinforced the frame of a rigged election through which their audiences would interpret the events of the 2020 election. However, this, this effort wasn't simply top down. The, the, the 2020 election disinformation campaign was what I want to call participatory. I've mentioned that word before. Uh, and the effort incorporated the work of thousands of other folks, um, not just political elites, but they included sort of partisan media outlets, social media all-stars and everyday political activists. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of what I mean by participatory and two kind of different examples. So the first one, over the course of the fall, we saw numerous incidents. This one came through the desk. I know this one so well, it came through the desk while I was one of the on-call um, researchers. And so we had a, a little, a, a team that was working and, and, and this, this, this incident came through in I think September. And we saw a lot of other ones like this where um, they, uh, there were claims that ballots were being improperly discarded. And some of those worked, um, they, they worked generally to sort of sow distrust in the mail-in voting process. So there was a lot of um, uh, claims about ballots being found in ditches or ballots being found in the garbage. Um, and here's an example from back in September. And it claims with a photograph that more than a thousand mail-in ballots had been found in a dumpster. And it was building on this narrative that we couldn't trust the mail-in process. You can't trust the, 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 the mail-in voting process. And the, alter, the author ended his tweet with the words, big if true. And this is the way that uh, a lot of folks, they don't take ownership of what they say. They kind of spread things without having to take responsibility. It's a, it's a trick in, in terms of um, how people spread misinformation. It's, it's a tactic, except you know this isn't true. Um, it's missing key context that undermines the bigness of the tweet uh, because it was actually, these, these are not even ballots, they're ballot folders. They're folders that the ballots go into and they're not from 2020, they're from two, 2018. And the law says that you have to discard those 22 months after they're used. So they're being discarded two months uh, before the election. So it was 22 months after the last, last election. So they're not even related to the 2020 election, um, but they're being framed as if they are in order to undermine trust in the election. So they're just ballots that were being recycled per the law and, and they're being, um, they're being mis, misframed. Um, so let's look at, a, at a, one of the graphs that we kind of created. This is kind of our special sauce. We would create a lot of these graphs that kind of show how, um, how, and we use Twitter data a lot because Twitter data is public. We looked at other platforms as well, but here we're looking at Twitter data. And what these are um, is kind of like, this is a cumulative graph. This is how, on the y-axis is how many total tweets have been spread and the x-axis is time. And, um, and we, what we do here is we plot each tweet by how many followers they have. So we can see the effects of large sized accounts and we can see the participation of large sized accounts in these kinds of conversations. And so in this case, the first tweet that we have here that's related is down here. The, the little red one before isn't actually related. It just had some similar terms. But the first tweet that's related to this is Eliza Schaefer. He's a journalist with The Blaze, uh, which is a right wing media outlet. He was inside the Capitol building on January 6th. He was in Nancy Pelosi's office. Um, he was claiming to be a journalist there at the time. But just to give you some context on the, on the intersection between these two things. So he's sharing this tweet and it, and it eventually goes viral. It gets 25,000 um, or so retweets. But we can also see who it goes through. So it goes through other sort of right-wing activists. It goes through the a website called the Gateway Pundit, which was repeatedly spreading, um, spreading this kind of false and misleading narrative. And and eventually goes out through um, one of the accounts of Donald Trump's two adult sons. Um, in this case, it was Donald Trump Jr. His other son is, is also active in some of these. And so you can see this kind of progression from smaller kind of accounts to larger and, and larger ones um, as these echo through the ecosystem. So online participants repeatedly activated to produce and spread information that sowed doubt in the election, highlighting irregularities, exaggerating the impacts of small issues like stolen mail and spreading falsehoods like this one. Not necessarily because they wanted to mislead people, but because they think the information is true or might be true and they want it to be true. And they found it useful for their particular objectives to gain attention or score political points or both. And in some cases, they did this because they were asked to. 
Um, they, before the election, the Trump campaign explicitly encouraged its audiences to participate in the Army for Trump where they would go to the polls and document evidence of potential voter fraud. So they were encouraged to kind of try to find the, this kind of evidence and spread it in order to kind of build this narrative. And I want to do, I want to give you one more case to kind of show uh, even more. So at this one, the, the first one I talked about top down, the second one is like kind of smaller influencers reaching larger influencers. But this last one is really a ground up narrative. And it was a narrative that emerged on election day and it was called Sharpie Gate. And it was related to issues with that people were having with Sharpie pens bleeding through ballots. And the narrative began with a couple of people posting stories from different parts of the country describing how they or someone they knew or heard about had been given a Sharpie pen to vote and how the pen had bled through the ballot. <clears throat> and they were worried that their votes may not have counted. Official accounts actually attempted to correct these concerns on election day. They explained that the ballots were designed to be used with Sharpie pens and that the bleed through wouldn't affect the vote counting. And in fact, they needed them to use Sharpie pens because they dry faster and they don't, uh, they don't smear in the machines the way an ink pen will. Um, but these official uh, statements did little to alleviate the concerns, which grew as more people shared their fears. Initially, the tone of these tweets was one of concern, worries that votes weren't going to count, and directives for people to bring their own pen. But as time went on, the content took a more suspicious tone, reflecting this existing collective belief that the election would be rigged. Eventually, the discourse shifted to the explicit accusation that this, these Sharpie pens were an intentional effort to disenfranchise specifically Trump voters. And that shift occurred right as the content began to take off and go viral. And I'm gonna give you a couple of little views of how it went viral. And again, a little bit about who took it viral. Um, if we look at this like temporal graph of the Sharpie term and, and sort of how it goes off, it starts on election day with these, uh, let me give you even more zoomed in. So I'm gonna uh, focus on this section here, kind of how it takes off. So it starts on election day with uh, in the white part of the graph with just a, a few thousand tweets. Actually, it's like about 500. Um, just a few people kind of think it's not really taking off yet, but then it really begins to take off in this yellow section. And I'm going to explain, explain sort of how, how that happens. Um, so when it takes off is right in the early morning hours of, of November 4th, so the night after the election. And what ha has happened is the state of Arizona has been called for Joe Biden. And this surprised the Trump campaign. And they're trying to figure out why that happened. And very quickly, Though the Sharpie gate claims had actually happened in a lot of different states, the conversation begins to converge around Sharpies as, a, as a, one of the possible explanations for why Donald Trump didn't win in Arizona. And so it begins to be used to question the results in Arizona. And if we look at the big accounts of who's spreading this, not surprisingly, we see some of the same right-wing influencers that appeared in our repeat offenders table above, um, with Charlie Kirk is someone who appears often there, um, as well as J Donald Trump's two as adult sons. And there's actually, we've looked a little deeper more recently and found other sort of right-wing operator operatives who are, are helping this content kind of go viral. These repeat offender accounts were pushing the Sharpie Gate narrative right, it begins, right as it begins to spread widely, likely as an explanation of why President Trump had apparently lost to, to Joe Biden in Arizona. Now, let's step back a little bit. So President Trump and his campaign didn't just prime their audiences to be receptive to false narratives of voter fraud. They inspired the audiences to produce those narratives themselves and then echoed those false claims back to them. Social media allow for this two-way exchange between populist political elites and their audiences, these kinds of grievance feedback loops. And it's like collective production of, of disinformation um, or propaganda more broadly. And this dynamic is really powerful. Participants can become extremely invested in these narratives. And I wanna show you something that really for me drives home the power of these narratives and the difficulty it, 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 it how difficult it is to correct them. So I wanna show you this example. Um, so on, on November 4th, the day after, so Sharpie Gate kind of, the election is still kind of uncertain. Arizona has been called for, for candidate Biden. Um, it's being resisted by the Trump campaign. Uh, and on, on the day after no, November 4, um, a number of people began to share evidence that their vote had been canceled. So they say, you know, they'd voted with a Sharpie pen, they were in Arizona, and now they're finding out 
that their vote was canceled. In fact, they were sharing a website that they could go to to check whether or not their vote had been canceled. And here's an example. This was spread um, pretty widely, uh, uh, several thousand retweets and almost 15,000 likes or 14,000 likes. Um, so, so content that was, was going viral. And this person claims that she voted in Sharpie Pen and then she's found that her vote had been canceled. Except when you look more closely, what it actually says here is that her mail-in ballot was canceled when she decided to vote in person. And, and the this website doesn't tell them the status of their in-person vote. It tells them the status of their mail-in ballot. But they didn't see that because they were so caught up in they used the Sharpie, they're concerned, they went to this website, it's telling them this information. And they don't actually realize that what's happening is they're misinterpreting the information they see. And this misinterpretation is very similar to other misinterpretations of glitches and statistical anomalies and other narratives that we saw along the way. And they become wrapped up in this collective experience of being cheated, one that will be very hard to correct. These people weren't just told that they would be, would, would be cheated or that they had been cheated. Many of them actually had this false experience of being cheated and then sharing that experience with others. And it's a very, very powerful, uh, uh, again, a very, very powerful effect. Um, stepping back from the examples, and just to give you all some, some picture into history that many of us know, is that Sharpiegate soon got wrapped up into the larger meta narrative or movement called Stop the Steal. Um, and the, the term was actually or, uh, created much earlier by, um, by other sort of operatives on the right, um, and then operationalized again here in 2020. Uh, they used Stop the Steal to organize rallies, including the rally that um, was happening as the insurrection um, begins to take shape. Um, and yeah, the Stop the Steal movement, it culminates in the grand finale event on January 6th. And many of the people that, that, that went there went there um, thinking that somehow they were going to stop the certification because they didn't feel that the election had been fair based on all this mis and disinformation. And on January 6th, we end up with, with this picture. So stepping away of like how, how we get here um, and, and thinking more about the model of participatory disinformation, I wanna um, kind of present this and then I'm gonna stop talking and we're gonna have a conversation. But this is something I've been working on of like um, trying to help people understand th this. And I think many of us know people that are part of this and um, some of us may be in some of these cycles in different ways. Um, but uh, we've been talking about this as participatory disinformation or what Alicia Wanless and, and colleagues have termed participatory propaganda. Um, and so it, I, I, when thinking about this kind of intersection between political elites and their audiences and the dynamics there. And so what we saw here was that political elites repeatedly spread the message of a rigged election, which set an expectation of voter fraud among their audiences. And this became a frame through which events around the elections were, uh, around the election were interpreted. The online crowds generated false and misleading stories of voter fraud, reinforcing that frame. Now, sometimes these stories may have been produced intentionally with knowledge that they were false. But in the cases I show you, I don't think the people that started either of those cases thought that they were false. They thought that they were true. They were generated sincerely through misinterpretation. The person who took that picture of those ballots in the, in the trash can or the ballot envelopes thought that those were ballots from 2020. They thought that that was voter fraud that they were exposing. These grassroots activists and social media influencers then help amplify these stories and pass the content up to the elites. And the political elites echo the false and misleading stories back to their audiences, reinforcing the frame, building the sense of co collective grievance. And the audiences echo and reiterate that sense of co collective grievance. We can ex even see in the social media data that they begin to use more violent language and begin to have calls to action and, and start to mobilize on top of that misinformation. And the political elites then begin to organize those audiences into protests and those protests eventually led on, unfortunately to the attack, uh, violent attack on the Capitol on January 6th. So we can see that, that participatory disinformation makes for this very powerful dynamic. Um, it's enabled by social media, but it also implicates the broader media ecosystem such as cable news and hyper-partisan media outlets, as well as some members of the political establishment. And these tight feedback loops between elites and their audiences seem to make the system more responsive, um, but they may also be leading it to spin out of control. And we're seeing similar dynamics around this in, in with other populist movements in other parts of the world, in Brazil, India, the Philippines, and elsewhere. Brazil is already facing, um, in their upcoming election, very similar claims of election fraud by the incumbent leader there. Um, 
And we're gonna see other kinds of disinformation using these same models as well. So um, with that, I'm gonna get away from my Dr. Doom. Uh, that's what my wife's been calling me um, because my talks can be so depressing. Um, uh, maybe step back a little bit and think about what do, what do we do now? And, and what does it mean to be in a world where these kinds of things are there? And how do we start to put a wrench uh, in the system? And um, to try to end on a little more hopeful note than, um, than others, uh, I do see this problem as, as something that there's no single solution. We're not gonna like come up with like, oh, if we just design Facebook a little differently, everything's gonna be better. But I do think um, we need to start chipping away at this problem from all sides through better dig digital media literacy, civic media literacy, through better platform design, possibly better uh, platform policies, for instance, around repeat offenders, perhaps through a little bit of regulation, although we don't want it too, too much because we, we do run into problems with the First Amendment there. Um, and through all of us just becoming more aware of, of what's happening and, and trying to intervene both in our own toxic media interaction, you know, the way we participate, but also um, talking to family members and others to try to help them understand what's happening. So, um, and then as researchers to continue to try to like, you know, expose this stuff and, 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 and communicate about it and, and try to help people see um, the difficulty of the challenges we face and come up with some solutions for how to address it. And with that, I think I'm going to stop sharing, come back and answer your questions. Thank you all for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Starbird. Um, I'm Madeline Mutt. I am the head of the Research Commons, which is one of the parts of the UW Libraries that's been organizing this event. So my colleague, Verletta Kern, and I will go through the questions that have been submitted in the Q&A and try to get as many of them as possible answered. Um, and there was a question that came in in the chat as well before you started talking that I think you've pretty much addressed or you started to allude to as you wrapped up. And it was a question about whether there are other countries or parts of the world where you're also doing research. It's such a good question. I think we're, um, I, I, the way we work is, is mixed method. I don't think there's a push button like we can go, you know, push this button out comes the research. And, and because it, it's mixed method, qualitative research really um, requires deep contextual knowledge, deep linguistic knowledge, cultural knowledge, and other things. And so we are very hyper aware that like uh, we can study certain problems really well with the research team we have. Um, if we want to study other contexts, we have to collaborate with other folks in those contexts or um, bring in researchers from, from those places and things. So we have been um, uh, at the CI, the Center for Informed Public, pre pretty focused on English language conversations up until now. Um, although we do have some researchers working in sort of Vietnamese language um, content related to election 2020 and possibly related to vaccine misinformation as well. Um, and we're thinking about, um, it, it, we're doing collaborations with other kinds of groups because it's not just language barriers, there's other, other ones as well. We're working um, with Black Brilliance, a partner, um, in Seattle on, on a related project about uh, mis and disinformation. It's not my project, but some of my colleagues are working on that. Um, and I'm, I'm part of it, but I don't, I don't run that show. Um, so we are, are trying to support other kinds of things and we are um, actively um, not recruiting, but looking to make connections. And um, one of our ideas with our rapid response model is to, as we build tools and processes to, um, to help other folks use those in their context, whether we're collaborating with them or we're lending them our frameworks or some of our analysts. But um, we do think that, that a lot of these questions need the support of people who um, have that, that language and, and contextual expertise. And if there's a question that you have that you're really interested in, um, we're happy to su support you with data collection and methods and collaboration. So definitely reach out. I think we learned so much about um, the problems we're facing here by, um, and every way, I think th th this problem is global. And in any one context, we might learn things that are gonna be applicable to others. And, 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 we're, and so many people in so many places are, are facing similar challenges. So I think it is really important to do more work um, beyond the English language and the Western uh, focused context. Thank you. You talked a little bit in your talk about how the topics you're researching can be polarizing. 
Um, one of the questions that's come in is how do you and your team protect yourselves and each other online? And how do you manage and maintain your digital safety with regards to threats like online harassment and doxing? Yeah, I think these are all front of mind. Um, there's, there's so many <laughs> attack surfaces. I don't even know that word three or four years ago. There's, there's so many ways um, when you're doing work that, that is about some of these toxicities, <laughs> um, you put yourself like right in the line of fire for the kinds of folks that may use either smear campaigns, disinformation campaigns, or harassment, brigading, um, and, and a lot of those digital, digital harassment techniques and possibly even physical uh, harassment techniques. And I think um, it's an ongoing conversation for us. We also have mental health impacts of seeing this content. Um, you know, reading tweet after tweet after tweet of people who share a completely different reality. Um, and, and, and a lot of that stuff can be, is disinformation is purposefully disorienting. And so um, mental health impacts is another dimension. Um, our, our community at the Center for Informed Public we're putting in structured like, um, you know, trainings, meetings, and just like uh, talk sessions <laughs> about um, about a lot of these topics. And we have a biweekly meeting with our with our research team where we're either talking about the mental health effects or the like, how do we keep ourselves safe? Um, but that being said, there's no playbook. There's no guidebook that someone just handed us. And like, here's what we do. It's really um, an improvisation. We're trying to write some of those guidebooks. We're writing some of those papers about how people can protect themselves. We've, we're, we've sought out experts to give us, you know, trainings and, and, and advice, but I, I can't say there's one like simple, like this is how you're gonna protect yourself, but it is a constant conversation for us on a lot of dimensions, including having people infiltrate our organization, something we talk about all the time. And that's a, that's a risk that's always there as well. Great, thank you. Um... So we've had a, there's a two-part question that's come in from an MLIS student at UW, a UW graduate student. And I think you've, you sort of touched on the first part of their question, which was, has any of your research ever faced any opposition? Um, if you'd like to speak to that more, um, please do. But the, the second part of the question is, as a student, is there any opportunity to get involved with your research or with Center for an Informed Public's research? Yeah, the the first one that we face have the opposition. If if we're if we're making any impact in this space, we will. So every time we we feel like we're we're you know someone's mad at us or they've written us bad emails or they filed a lawsuit, we know that we're making an impact. Uh, so I guess that's a that's something we can um, can um, you know we always take that as a as a sign of of, of impact and even as we are, are shoring up our defenses. So absolutely, we, we face um, we face things. Although. I, I think we're we're well aware that um, you know if we keep doing this work, what we faced in the past is nothing like what we might face in the future. So um, we're we're always working to kind of shore up our defenses. Um, in terms of how students can get involved, um, the the best first step for a student is probably to enter through a directed research group. Um, and so we run directed research groups out of HCDE and the I School related to specific projects on on misinformation. And we advertise those, you know, before the next quarter and students can apply to get into those, those groups. Um, a second way I, I can guarantee you we're going to do something around 2022 uh, in the midterm election, very similar kind of rapid response. And we'll be recruiting students probably in the summer or um, before the fall quarter to join those efforts. And, um, and again, there'll be an application process and, and a vetting process, and then we'll do some training. So, um, so look for both directed research groups every before each about a month before every quarter starts. Start looking at the websites of the of the I, uh, I school and HCDE. You may also be able to contact the CIP directly, and, and our, our communications person can point you to like a, a list of possible opportunities that we update from time to time. And, and then again, like if you're interested in our, in our fall activities, just contact us probably um, mid-August uh, would be when we're gonna get ready to, to do that work. And we'll be bringing on probably 20 students next fall. Great. The next question we have takes a slightly different tact. Um, what role can researchers play in combating myths or disinformation in a world where personal stories and storytelling seem to resonate more with the public than collected data? 
such a great that's such a great um, question and something we think about a lot. Um, I think when we approach how we communicate our work, we often do that through stories. We do those through data stories because I, I do think data can be compelling as well. Um, but one of the things we were successful with with our rapid response operations were realize them that we're not we're not communicators. We're not crisis communicators. We're researchers. And so one of the things we did was try to connect with journalists and um, either like collaborations, though those, those were very messy. I have a student writing a paper about collaborating with journalists, um, but also just like we, we would actually say, oh, journalist is working on something. Oh, we've, we've got a story about that. Here's our data story. But then they went and did the interviews to tell the personal story. So it had, you know, it would lead with the personal story and then it would give like the hard data in the middle that we were collecting and then would end with the personal story again. So connecting our analysis up with, with storytellers um, who are also doing those personal kinds of things, I think could be really valuable um, for, for communicating the challenges that we're facing. And so it's a, that's a perfect question, something that, um, that, I, that I think we've made some inroads in, but uh, I think it's the right question. It is like some of the best work combating misinformation, disinformation that I've seen is coming from the, the, the journalists on this new misinformation beat um, who, are, who are telling those stories, really compelling stories and really understanding what I was trying to communicate today, and I don't know if it comes through in, in this talk, is that you know there's not bad people that are fought, that are getting wrapped up into this. Uh, you know there are bad people manipulating them, but most of the people that are involved in this are, are sincere believers of this stuff who are vulnerable and, and being taken advantage of, and they don't want to be told that it's, it's condescending, and I understand that as well. But like to have empathy and, and understanding how they got there and to tell their stories, I think is really valuable, especially if we're going to try to think about how can people come out of that. Um, I think we need to hear more stories about how people have come out of that in order to understand how how even researchers can su can support it. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a remaining question, and I see another one has just come in. I'll let Perletta present that one. But you know, you this question um, about the role of journalists, I think you sort of just happened to speak to that in your answer to the previous question. Um, but I'm wondering about the, the second part of this question, which is what skills do researchers need to learn to have more impact, you know, more immediate impact or impact in the now? And perhaps if any of those are things that you see as tied in with working with journalists, um, we're interested in your thoughts on that. You know, I, I think there's that chip away slide. There's so many this is an interdisciplinary problem. There's so many different kinds of researchers and there's so many different places to make impact. There's design of educational curriculum. There's, to, there's you know, advising platforms on how to better design their, their, um, their affordances or like their features. There's like advising platforms on how to design their policies. There's designing, talking to platforms about how to design their algorithms. Like there's so many places to have impact um, on the rapid response stuff that we do, there's certain skills that I think are really valuable, um, a certain kind of, you know, um, having some technical skill to be able to code up quickly, visualize things and kind of dive into the data, but matched with a willingness to actually read content. Um, anyone who thinks that they can just push a button and, and here's the answer going to pop out, they don't understand this work very well because you really have to read the content. And every time I make the mistake of, of relying too much on like the, the quantification, the, you know, the, the visualization, and I, and I forget to just read the content for a while, I realize I make these, these false assumptions and I, and, I get, and I draw false conclusions. And so for me, it's like a, a mixture of skills and almost a little bit of humility and appreciation for for the qualitative aspects of the, the work um, is really important, I think, on, on, on our kinds of analysis, the way that we're making an impact. That's the kind of researcher that I think does really well in, in our work. Um, and someone who can, who, can, who can communicate well. So after, after we've kind of figured it out, how do, we, how do we communicate that? How do we tell those stories? That storytelling aspect, I think, is really valuable as well. And whether that's through a presentation or like a blog or you know a paper, I think you know people that can that can translate the findings and our insights into into communication of different kinds. That's a real that's a real a, a real skill. Great. Um, 
our next question is um, your, about your collaboration and your work with graduate students specifically. So the question is, um, you, you often you know, acknowledge and shout out graduate students on Twitter um, in your presentations. And um, how, how do you go about mentoring graduate students in this area, particularly when you've, you've talked about it is kind of a stressful area to, to work in at times. So can you talk a little bit about graduate student involvement and relationships and mentoring there? Yeah, and that's something that's really evolved a lot in the last couple of years. Um, five years ago, I, I was I had a lab, and there it was me, and my and there was graduate students, and then I had a collaborator, Emma Spiro, and sometimes she and I would co-mentor, and but it was just a small group of us. And 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 right now, what we have is really different. With with the Center for an Informed Public, we now have you know uh, multiple faculty members. Um, and many, many students and the students and postdoctoral researchers as well. So we do have more of like a, a community of mentoring where um, for each each student or, or, or postdoc that we're working with, we, we, I do have one-on-ones, but we're also there. Most of the students in our group are usually, usually have two faculty members at least that they're working with and a postdoctoral researcher. And, um, and we have multiple meetings throughout the week, whether it's a research meeting, and then there's a community building meeting, and then there's um, and there's a lab lab meeting, and then there's a fourth meeting that happens where we're doing the um, uh, community of care support kinds of stuff. So we have a lot of like um, it's not a single one to one relationship right now. It's a very team uh, team oriented thing. If that's not your thing, then it probably is not a good fit for you. I, but um, the great thing is during the pandemic, I feel like we've had um, a lot of we've been able to maintain community just through. Um, through having a lot of meet, a lot of meetings, a lot, a lot of Zoom, a lot of Zoom, but um, but they, it's been Zoom with a purpose, and I think um, I think we've been able to 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 support students well. Of course, it's not perfect, um, and and we're still kind of working through some of the the places where students can fall through in that kind of team mentoring environment as well. Thank you. Um, we just have one final question that's been submitted in the Q&A. So um, if, if you've got questions still, we definitely have time for them. Please go ahead and submit them. And this question as it's written is, do you ever have to censor any of the information you're presenting? And if I could expand on that a little, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, even if you're not censoring things in the strict definition of the word, like are there things you have to think through before or when you're releasing your results or your information because, um, you know, these, yeah, these are very current issues and um, a lot of strong feelings are around this. So thanks. Constantly. And there's so many different dimensions of that. We're, you know, um, in fact, one of the, the, this paper that we just submitted that came from working with journalists, we have this whole call for like, um, for, community to help us develop guidelines because we feel like we're making these decisions we, we're trying to build sort of ethical guidelines for how we um, approach in our own presentations and our own papers how we cite the the evidence um, and preserve privacy for people that would have had a reasonable expectation of privacy and at the same time, um, when we work with journalists, that becomes even more complicated because they're used to trying to expose things and we're trying to, you know, we want to show you what happened, but we don't actually want to give you this account name or that account name. And we've developed certain like rules of thumb of like if it's a public figure or if it's a person who's verified or a person that has over 100,000 followers or maybe we need to lift that to 200,000 followers or whatever. Then, then we feel that, that the public has a right to know and that we'll, 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 we'll publish that content. If it's a person who doesn't have that many followers, who's private, who maybe didn't understand what was going on, who's sort of you know one of the, the unwitting folks that are part of it, we don't normally want to expose their personal, um, their account details or something else. Um, 
in in some cases, if it's been a couple of, you know, if we put it in a paper, I probably won't even put screenshots. We'll probably um, put text and actually change the text around so it won't be searchable for a long period of time. Um, for our presentations, we tend to use screenshots um, and try to obscure the names, but it's a constant conversation um, because we don't want to out people. We don't want to embarrass people. Um, but we do want to hold people in powerful positions to account for being bad actors, right? And so balancing off like um, illuminating bad actors versus protecting people that are caught up into this is a is a constant tension for us. And it's something, and there's so many Slack chats where like, oh, so-and-so just asked for this data. Should we give it to them? And I'm like, oh gosh, we got to go through and black out, you know, you know, some number of accounts, but we can give some of the accounts, we got to black out the other ones, or I'll give you tweets from that account, but I'm not going to give you tweets from this other account if you ask me for them, because I think they had an expectation of privacy. But it's a, yeah, it's something that we're still, we're still kind of collectively working on that internally, but we're also looking to the broader community for, for, you know, to co-develop some ethical guidelines around that. Because there's nothing we, we're allowed, I could give the journalist whatever tweet I had in my data set, but I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. Especially when the accounts have been deleted or suspended and those kinds of things, it really does um, some tricky decisions there. So we have one final question that just came in and it's a question that um, I think is a challenging one that all of us have seen. If we encounter um, misinformation or disinformation um, around folks we know um, that we're connected with, how can we go and try to navigate those conversations um, that this may be misinformation? Um, do you have any thoughts or suggestions for that? It's the, I mean, that's the, <laughs> that's the question we're <laughs> we all face over, over and over again. Um, there's a real value in corrections. Um, we've talked about this thing called the backfire effect. It is, it's been overblown. It doesn't play out. Like there really is a value in corrections. That being said, like how we correct is really important. Um, in the moment, if you correct someone, um, there's no chance that, that they're going to, to acquiesce to what you say. So you have to think about like, you know, am I correcting this and, and who am I doing it for? Am I doing it because I want to be right or am I doing it because I, I want to help them? But um, I, my, the biggest thing is like with empathy, with the understanding that we've all spread misinformation, every single one of you, if I went through all your social media posts, if I go through my own, I will tell you, we have, we have, we have shared misinformation. It just has happened. Um, and so to correct with empathy and, and from that kind of understanding, um, if it's someone you care about, do not correct them publicly. <laughs> right this is a private conversation better in person if possible or like where you can see each other's faces where you're able to say you know i love you i care about you i'm, I'm trying to help and also be open to listening to their explanations their first explanation is always going to be oh even if it's not true it might as well be true and whatever but don't judge their reaction in that moment to what your impact may be because your impact may be that the next day or the next week they make a different decision even though in the moment they were naturally defensive because we all would be if someone put us on the spot um and then if it's a stranger um there is some value in correcting not for that person but to correcting audiences in social media spaces but just recognize that it might get you blocked and and it might not make you a lot of friends so um you gotta to make your own choices about how to do that but um, the number one thing you can do is be really cognizant of your own sharing to correct yourself when you make mistakes uh, and to not try to hide them. And I think that's one thing that um, is hard to do, but it actually gives you more credibility and it helps us build trust, more trustworthy information spaces. And so I, I highly recommend that as well, as well as sort of slowing down and, and being more reflective about how, um, how we're emotionally triggered to share misinformation. It's not that we can just kind of follow this rules and we're gonna find misinformation. It's really about tuning into our emotional responses because that's how um, misinformation activates us to spread it, so. Thank you so much. Um, and I think it's appropriate that we close on sort of a, this hopeful note of some things that we can do interpersonally to combat misinformation. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Starbird, for this fascinating talk. And to all of our audience members, thanks for your interest and questions. Um, we're glad to have you at Hacking the Academy. And just thank you again.